Good morning. Please do sign the friendship pads and put them in the offering plates when the time comes for that. If you're watching us on Facebook, welcome. Why don't you check in with us and let us know. And if you're watching the video, maybe you could like and share it down the, down the road a ways. That's how we spread the word and we'd love for that to happen. Um, there will be no High Point youth group tonight. Tim is not, Tim Gogley is not feeling well. So if you didn't get that news, there it is. There won't be a youth group tonight. We will have the Lenten series tonight, though, and we'll have uh, food, and we're taking a free will offering for that as well. I've been asked to, re to remind us all of that. I know that neither Linda nor I carry cash very often anymore, and so it's, it's always a bit of a surprise when we see that jar. So if you uh, are planning to come tonight, you might want to give a thought to that as well. We have this really great collection of winter coats that are apparently living here at the church now. They are uh, on the racks 24 seven and Sarah Kelsheimer, hi Sarah, tells me that uh, some of them are really nice. Some of them are probably a little bit of money. So um, you might wanna think about that if you're, it's the time of year when in the morning you need a coat but in the afternoon you don't sometimes and that's probably what's happening. Um, oh, this is the week that all of the Older college age kids are here. Welcome. Glad you're here, you guys, this morning. Glad you're here. Um, it, it helps because a lot of other folks aren't here this morning, but we're, we're glad you are. Um, 5.30 this evening for the Lenten study series. Supper first and then a quick study. Tonight we're going to be in Matthew chapter 10, if you want to take a look at that in advance. Wednesday night we will have Bible study and brew at the Terre Haute Brew Pub. Uh, Tuesday night is our committee and commissions this week, um, so that also will have a meal at it. So lots of chances to eat with your fellow Presbyterians. Uh, Friday at 11 a.m. we have our staff meeting. Please uh, take a look if you haven't done already. In your bulletin there will be an order form for flowers for Easter. If you intend to do that, the deadline is next Sunday, so don't let it go too long. Finally, I am going to start a new Bible study. That's a done deal now. It's going to be on Friday mornings at 9 a.m. starting on April the 10th. I don't know where yet because I'm trying to find a place in Terre Haute that serves a, a vegan option for breakfast. And so far, I have struck out. If anybody knows of a place that they might suggest to me, please tell me. I'd like to know about that. I'd like to keep those options open for all the folks who have different dietary needs. For our prayer concerns this morning, Winnie McCammon has a friend who is, I don't have a name for her, it's not in the e-news. Glenna? Okay, she has a, a very difficult case of cancer. Uh, her sister had come to help her and then her sister fell on some ice and has lost about a lot of her capacity, so it's just a really tough situation. So let's pray for Glenna and her sister, and then also for Jean Shutt. I've uh, had a chance to talk uh, repeatedly with Chuck over the months, and uh, she has had a difficult winter, is the way that Chuck wants it put out there, and it's gotten better, so thank God for that, but would you hold both uh, Chuck and Jean up in prayer as well? Let us worship God. Good morning. Please join me 
in the call to worship. Give glory to our God, who on this day won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Let us worship our Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us worship our Lord, the Savior of the world. Ours is a God of justice, waiting to be gracious to us, yearning to have pity on us. Blessed are all who wait upon the Lord. In penitence and faith, let us confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty God, who sent a star to guide people to the Holy Child, Jesus, we confess that we have not followed the light of your word. We have not searched for signs of your love in the world or trusted good news to be good. We have failed to praise your son's birth and broken his peace on earth. We have expected little, hoped for less. Forgive our doubt and renew us in all godly desires that we may watch and wait and once more hear the glad story of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The God of love became one of us, that he might die as we die. He remained 
God, that he might come back to life. He became incarnate in human flesh, that we might know forgiveness and live in peace. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Our sins are forgotten, our hopes secure. Hallelujah. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? Well, last month when I was here, it was Martin Luther King's birthday and Black History Month. Do you know what month we celebrate now? What? Easter. Oh, Easter. Very good. We are in the season of Lent. What else? Lent. Yeah. St. Patrick's Day month kind of feels like that. Um, I, I love that. And what's also Women's History Month. Ooh, just the other day it was International Women's Day. So I made sure to give high fives to my girls in class. But did you know there are lots of important women in the Bible too? Loads of them, and I don't think we talk about them enough. Um, can you name any important women in the Bible? What? Yeah, there's some water right there. Mary, good one. Anybody else? I think we better do some homework, huh? What? Ruth. Ruth. Yeah. There's a bunch. But Eve even, you know? But today we're learning about a woman at a well. I gotta keep that, buddy. Um, and we need to imagine a long time ago where there wasn't water in their houses. Have you ever been camping? Yeah, and there's no water in your tent? It's a little different than being at home where we're able to just turn on the water, isn't it? There's a lot of water right there, huh? Um, how do you feel when you get really thirsty? How do you feel? Hot. Really hot? Annoyed. Annoyed? Yeah, your body starts getting angry. How do you feel? What can I do? Oh, those are cool. Okay, what's your favorite drink? Is it hot tea? No? Is it hot cocoa? Yeah. <gasps> That's a good one. Is it coffee? No. Oh, that's mine. Um, is it like Gatorade or Propel? Yeah. Yeah? That's a good one. What about um, lemonade? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. What about after you play a really, really hard soccer game or basketball game or whatever and you're so thirsty? Do you have Orange Crush? Yes, 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 yes. How would that feel? 
<laughs> what about good old water? Water. We are really, really lucky that we have clean water in our houses, in our town. Even in the United States, there's places where they struggle with clean water. But our story today from the Bible, it's going to be heavy. I need your help in a minute. Um, was that there was a woman who needed to go get water at the well in the middle of the day. It was very, very hot. Can you picture like summer, 95 degrees outside, and she's got to go get water. She'd waited until that time because other people don't want to get water in the middle of the day when it is that hot. She had done some bad things, and so people didn't want to talk to her, and she didn't want to talk to them. So off she goes to the well. Ooh, buddy, in the middle of the day. And guess who was there? Hmm? Not me. No, this was a long time ago. Yep. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it was Jesus. Jesus was there. And she and he talked to her. And she was like, Why are you talking to me? Why are you talking to me? Why are you asking me for water? He didn't even have a cup. So she said, sure, you know, but oh, look at that. So in the end, after their little conversation, he said, you know what? I have something better than water. He has living water. He can give us something that helps us quench our thirst way better than lemonade, hot cocoa, even coffee, or the best one, water. He can give us stuff for our spirit, for our soul, okay? Um, sometimes we get laughs from YouTube instead of laughs from our family or happy bellies from cake and cookies when really what we need are carrots, you know? Sometimes we take a drink of something because we're thirsty and really what we need is water. And sometimes we need to remember that Jesus can help us get the best drink of water for our insides than anything. Okay, so maybe next time you want to try it? You want to try lifting it? Can you imagine having to carry all of your water through the day? Oh, Nicholas, go. Wow, you are strong, buddy. We'll give it a try. Let's see. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I don't you need so help. Oh, yeah. my gosh. I don't need your help. <laughs> Good job. Good job, buddies. Well, I'm going to need your help here in a second. Whoa. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, let's remember. Who gives us the best water? Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. That's right. All right. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for all the drinks you give us, but thank you very much for the best, best one. Your living word, your spirit. All this your name we pray. Amen. Lord our God, bless our reading of your word, that we might come to a better understanding of your truth and will. We also ask that you might grow our spirits by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we might in turn be a blessing to your creation. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The first lesson today is Psalm 95, and while it may sound like it's mainly for the choir, I think it's for all of us. Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. 
For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day at Massah in the wilderness when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they do not regard my ways. Therefore, in my anger I swore, they shall not enter my rest.
Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. Sort of in the middle of a story, but um, the whole story was a little bit long, I felt. So this is John 4, 5. Listen now for the word of God. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had been given, had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out, <clears throat> tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came, and they were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want, or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. And she said to the people, Come and see a man who has told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? And they left the city and were on their way back to him. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. If Valerie were still in the sanctuary, I would thank her for having already preached my sermon for me. She got it right. Be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. Last Sunday, I told you that I enjoyed it when people would challenge me or question me about something I had said in the sermon, because that meant that you had been listening to me. Well, in last week's sermon, I mentioned that in colonial America, some men drank a barrel of whiskey every two weeks. 
After worship, one of you approached me and said, yeah, that whiskey thing, I did the math, it's not possible. <laughs> that would be 344 shots of whiskey a day. And I agree, that would be impossible. So then I speculated on the size of the barrel. barrel. Maybe that was different. Maybe that's what made it real. Well, it turns out that barrels then and now range in size from 5 to 259 gallons. The standard whiskey barrel in our time is 49 or 50 gallons, I think. Is that the person who challenged me? That's right, okay. So um, not, not that size for sure. And here's the thing, I, I got it out of a sidebar article in an issue of Discover Magazine from sometime in 2022. But I ripped it out of the magazine and sat it on my desk for a while before it finally became usable for me. I somehow wedged it into a sermon there someplace. And I didn't have any idea what month it came from, so I went online to the discover.com website, couldn't find it. I have no way to know or to verify the truth of this claim. And I make this comment to you now because I actually take it very seriously. I try to have attribution and verification for anything I say from the pulpit. That matters to me. Well, at the time those colonists were drinking whiskey, however much they drank, <laughs> sailing ships used sherry butts. Sherry, the, the alcoholic drink, but, B-U-T-T, -T, is a, a name for a very large barrel, 159, 129 gallons, excuse me. They stored fresh water in them. Think about it, sailing a ship, dozens of men over salt water, they had to take a lot of water with them. Each filled barrel weighed over a thousand pounds. Accordingly, the captain and his master would have calculated very carefully where to store those barrels on their ship because the trim of the ship, both the balance from side to side and the cant from forward to back, the trim of the ship was governed by those barrels of water. So they had to put them in the right place and they had to tie them down with very stout ropes because if those things got loose in a storm, they could damage the hull and kill men. According to the website phrases.com, this might be the origin of the phrase, water always wins. But the preferred explanation for water always wins is the fact that over time, water can rust, corrode, or otherwise damage even the mightiest of structures. They paint bridges over salt water as often as they can afford to, because if they don't protect them with the paint, the salt water can corrode even steel and degrade it to the point where it's unsafe. Ghost Ranch in the arid Sangre de Cristo Mountains of northern New Mexico has arroyos, arroyos, deep stream courses that have no water in them except when it rains. The average annual rainfall in that part of the world is a scant 10 inches per year but almost all of it comes at once in the month of August. At that point, when it rains like that, those arroyos become filled with rushing, powerful, pushing water. Wisely, the ranch has built no arroyo crossings. It would not be safe to put a structure near them because when they fill, they fill and they move. Even though it sometimes requires a detour of walking around an arroyo for several minutes, they don't put anything there and they don't put anything in the downstream area where the arroyo might someday get to because those things do change course during those heavy storms. Water always wins. And yet, we need water. Our lives literally depend on it. When we search for extraterrestrial life, one of the things we look for is water. We know that life can exist on other forms of liquid, but water is the one that we're most familiar with, so that's what we look for. Water is why the Samaritan woman came to the well in Sikkur at noon. She had to have water 
but she apparently could not get it in the evening when all the other women would have gathered to talk and to draw water. Sikhar was an overgrown small town. Everybody there would have known her business. They would have known that she'd had five husbands and was living with the sixth man, and that would not have gone over with those other women. Can you imagine? Fresh from his encounter with the ruler of the Jews, Nicodemus, in which he has spoken his most famous line, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, da -da 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 -da, Jesus now meets with another outlier, the Samaritan woman, drawing water from the well in the heat of the day. Jesus asks the woman for a drink, shocks her. Even to speak to her violates the Jewish customs. She is a Samaritan. And as John tells us, Jews do not share things with Samaritans. They don't play well in the sandbox together. Of equal or greater importance than the ethnic religious division, she is a she. She's a woman. He is a rabbi. They are alone, together. And they are out in the most public place in the whole town. Right in the middle of it. The well. When she asks, how is it that you, a Jew, asks a drink of me, a woman of Samaria, water has nothing to do with it. It has to do rather with the customs and laws about male-female interaction. Nagina Mosseini is the wife and mother of the family, Afghan family, whose case I managed when they were here in Terre Haute. She took to calling me her Indiana dad. I loved that. We spent hours, just the two of us, alone in my car, driving to medical appointments for her in Bloomington and Indianapolis. I carried her younger children around on my shoulders. If I stayed away from their house for too many days, she and or her husband would invite me to come by and then they would feed me that table full of stuff that was all so good. But when we said goodbye for the last time, Nagina gave me what I call the salam salute. The right hand on the left collarbone, and they say salam, which is peace in Arabic. And then she shook my hand. It would have been unthinkable for her, a devout Muslim woman, to give me a hug or anything else that we might have felt was appropriate. You just don't do that. This is what Jesus, this is the convention that Jesus is breaking, even to speak to this woman. And he tells the Samaritan woman that he has the power to give her living water, and once she drinks of it, she'll never thirst again. She does not understand. Not at first. She observes that he has no bucket. How is he going to get the water out of the well? And does he think he's better than Jacob, whose well this is? He tells her his water produces eternal life. She still doesn't get it. She does ask for it, but she does not yet know that he's not talking about H2O. He asks her to fetch her husband. She tells him she has no husband. And then he gives her a complete history of her entire marital life. She's beginning to catch on now. She says, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. This is a significant comment. The Samaritans did not accept anything in the Old Testament beyond Deuteronomy. Their holy scripture consisted entirely of the first five books of the Bible. Which means that all the written prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Zechariah, etc., they did not accept as God-inspired. But now this woman tells Jesus that she thinks he is a prophet. This is high praise. She is awakening to his identity. But she still tries to deflect the course of this conversation. It's making her uncomfortable, so she tries to get him into a theological dispute. We were talking earlier today about Twitter and how people can get hooked by the comments. 
She's kind of doing that. The Samaritans and the Jews disagree on where and how to worship God. If you're a prophet, could you please clarify that for me? He explains that everything has changed with his appearance. The hour has come when people will worship. Doesn't matter where. Doesn't matter how. Except that they'll worship in spirit and in truth. And he's about to reveal to her that he, the God, the Spirit, are all one. They're of the same substance. The woman says she knows that Messiah is coming, and that is something the Samaritans believed, although, again, they didn't get it from Scripture, because most all of the Old Testament places that we read into it as, as referring to the Messiah are in the prophets. No, New Testament scholar Daniel Migliori has speculated with some evidence that the Samaritans really depended mostly on oral tradition for most of their beliefs and that the Messiah would have been one of those traditions. So, she says, I know the Messiah is coming, but does she really get yet? It's not sure. The reference is telling. She's thinking about it. He might be the one. And then later when she goes into the town, she's going to say to all these other people, he, he couldn't be the Messiah, could he? Well, but the most important moment in this entire conversation comes next. When the Samaritan woman says, I know Messiah is coming, Jesus says, I am he, the one speaking to you. Actually, the Greek text does not use the word he. It just says, I am the one speaking to you. This is reminiscent of the Old Testament name for God, Yahweh, which lacks a precise English translation. But the best rendering, supposedly, is I am that I am. My Old Testament professor, Barney Anderson, called that the Popeye God. I am what I am. I am. God is. God exists. And Jesus is saying here, I'm God. For those who believe that Jesus never said, I'm God, here it is. This is it. Right here. The disciples returned from their grocery run. Though John tells us they were astonished he was speaking with a woman, none of them dares question her or him. And the woman leaves. She leaves her jar behind. Now, this is one thing that Valerie didn't include. I, I do have one thing I can add, which is that those jars were precious. They were expensive. They were big. They were treasured. Often they were handed down from generation to generation in a household. She leaves it behind in her excitement. She goes back into the city and tells people that probably don't want to talk to her anyway, come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. He couldn't be the Messiah, could he? Well, yes, he can. We have the, the advantage of the, with the testimony of the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell us that he is the Messiah. But she's catching on finally. Later in chapter 4, G John will record that Jesus will stay among the Samaritans for two more days talking to them. We don't know what he said, but John concludes this chapter with many more believed in him because of his words. And they explicitly call him the savior of the world. What started as a water break culminates in the conversion of many former antagonists into followers of Jesus. They went from enemies to followers. Water wins again. Now that the Samaritans could convert should come as very good news indeed to us. For we have far greater differences with the Samaritans and the Jews than they ever had with each other. And if the Samaritans can come to follow Jesus, so can we. They all spoke Aramaic. They had a common language, a form of Hebrew. They had differences in their religions, but really they were petty. 
and Picayune, minor details about where and how to worship God, but they all called him Yahweh. They all had at least those five books of the Old Testament in, in common. Yes, they had by Jesus' day experienced a little bit of time of tension between them, each other, but what do we have in common with, say, Jesus' disciples? Our faith in him is about all. We speak different languages, we have different customs, we live in a different time, we rely on technology that they never imagined, etc., etc., etc. But we do have that faith in that one God, Creator, Son, and Holy Spirit. And some things we say over water can really illustrate this commonality. I quote from the Presbyterian Book of Common Worship in its baptism litany. Quote, we give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things by the gift of water. In the beginning of time, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. It's a reference to Genesis. Creation, spirit moving over the water. Chaos existed, but once the spirit moved, order and life. The liturgy goes on to reference Noah and then, quote, you led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into the freedom of the promised land, the Exodus. And again, the Samaritans believed in that. It's a miracle as well. It's in the book of Exodus, one of their five books of their Bible. And of course, in the Presbyterian church, we always baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus spoke with the Samaritan woman about these three faces of God who are yet all one, and he was that God and is. If the Samaritans could bridge the gap between themselves and Jesus, so can we. Whatever doubts, whatever fears, whatever bad habits may push you away from God, in the waters of baptism, we remind ourselves that we already belong to God, body and soul. And we can find life-giving nourishment in those waters, which in truth do keep us from ever having to thirst spiritually again. Water always wins. Don't fight it. Drink it. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for all of your gifts, but especially for water, with all its symbolic richness. We thank you, Lord, for life, for hope, for faith, and we praise you that you have reminded us again and again, not just in baptism, but in many ways, that you are, and that you love us, and that you have saved us. In your name we pray, amen.
you would, please refer to your bulletins and recite with me our unison affirmation of faith from the Theological Declaration of Mormon. As Jesus Christ is God's assurance of the forgiveness of all our sins, so in the same way and with the same seriousness is he also God's mighty claim upon our whole life. 